Everything changed for Israel when Calvary happened. In fact, the truth of the matter is that in 4 BC when Jesus was born, the opportunity for Israel was at hand for them to accept the Messiah as the Messiah. And they even rejected the Messiah when he was born for all practical purposes. And in between that time of the 33 years between 4 B.C. and 30 A.D. when Christ was crucified on Calvary, His death, His burial, His resurrection, 40 days later His ascension, Israel missed their Messiah. And up until that point, uh, Paul gives us the example of that. We went through this last week of there's the vine and there's the root and God's the root and all sustenance comes from the root. But... For all, we must understand that at Calvary, Israel was the natural branches. In fact, that's the reason why I put their little leaves and everything in red. The red was Israel, and they were part of the plan, and they were part of God's, they were God's chosen people. They're part of the plan. They're part of the plan for salvation. They were looking for the Messiah. They were hoping for the Messiah. They were praying for the Messiah. And when the Messiah showed up, they said, He can't be the Messiah. And they missed it. And at Calvary, everything became level ground. Level ground for both Jew and Gentile alike. At Calvary, when they rejected the Messiah, the natural branches of God's people were broken off from the the vine and the root. You take those natural branches, you break them off, they're going to die and they're going to wither. However, Paul says in Romans that we just went through last week's last week's lesson there was um, there was a the, the wild vine that grows and those are the Gentiles we know who they are these are the Gentiles and in that God has broken off and taken some of them and grafted them into the root and the vine and they live and not only that God has taken some of the broken off branches of Israel and grafted them back in. But not all Israel is grafted in. And in fact, if you remember chapters 1 through chapters 11, Paul is trying to convince the Jews there in the Christian church in Rome to stop dealing with all the Jewish stuff that goes around religion and just put their simple faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul makes very clear the point that once you come to Christ, there, are, there is no more Jew, there is no more Gentile, no more Greek. Everyone belongs to the Lord at that point in time. Now running through the blood in their veins, they may have Jewish blood. And you know, we like to, we like to talk about Stuart being our favorite little Jew. You know, people ask me, he says, do you know any Hebrew? I said, yeah, I know a little Hebrew. He's about this tall. <laughs> But when he accepted the Lord as Savior and the Savior became his Messiah, his Jewishness, he was grafted back in just as he was. Yes, he may have Jewish flesh. He may have Jewish blood. It doesn't matter what his earthly tent is. He is now a Christian. He's a follower of the way. And because of that also, the gospel went to the Gentiles and they are cut and grafted in also. Now I want you to think about something. Think about this. God's plan was that all the nations, His promise to Abraham, all the nations would be blessed through the lineage of Abraham. Not only His children and His blood, but all the nations. So the plan was, and we know it in the Old Testament, for there to be a Messiah who is to come. We also know in the Old Testament, God foretold it, the Lord foretold it, that they would miss the Messiah and they would not accept Him. But in the way God organized things, I want you to just follow me in this track. What would have happened if Israel had not been broken off because they accepted the Messiah? What would have happened? What would have changed the plan for the Gentiles? Nothing. Because then the Gentiles would have accepted the gospel and taken the gospel to the Gentiles anyway. You got it? So whether the Jews accept him 
or don't accept him makes no difference for the Gentiles. God's plan and promise to Abraham was through his descendants and through his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Just keeping our theology straight here, okay? But Israel did miss him. And they were broken off. And so in the Old Testament, as we've seen, we've got it in the New Testament, we've also got it in the Old Testament, I've showed it to you already. The plan is, for one day, God is going to bring Israel to their knees. And in fact, if you're a member in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus has just been carried in on the donkey that morning, and the people have laid the palm branches at His feet, and they have said, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. His entrance goes into the temple. He cleans the temple out. Then he goes out to, out to the mount. And he's looking back at Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, O oh Jerusalem. Never again will you, Jerusalem, say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord until you see me coming in all my glory. That day has not happened. Not yet. It's still in our future. Well, Israel has been broken off, but some of the branches have been grafted back in, and the Gentiles are blessed in that. In fact, look here in Romans chapter 11, verse 28 and 29 from last lesson. What is the blessing for Israel? Has God, has God rejected Israel? Look, from the standpoint of the gospel, they... Now, I've written in this. I've written this in the brackets. Nation of Israel. They, or the nation of Israel, are enemies for you. Who are you? The believers in the church. They are enemies for your sake. Jews today, yesterday and Friday night, Jews all over the world went to their synagogue to worship God without a belief in the Messiah. They have a belief that He's going to come, but they missed Him. Therefore, they do not spread the gospel of the Messiah who came. They're still looking for a Messiah. Therefore, they are enemies to the believers in the church. Looking on. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they, that's the nation of Israel again, are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable. In other words, God's going to do what He promised. In the Old Testament, He's already told us they're going to be broken off. He's already told us they're going to be blind. He's already told some are going to be grafted back in. He's already told us that, that one day the nation of Israel will finally wake up and accept the Messiah who came and was crucified on the cross, <clears throat> and they will accept Him and they will turn to Him, and they will be the nation of the Messiah, the Lord. That's going to happen. And what God has promised is going to happen. Well, with that in mind, chapters 1 through chapters 11 all deal with getting the Jews to the point where they get rid of the need for circumcision. They get need of the re need for sacrifices. They get rid of all these external needs that they think they have to do in order to get to be part of the church. Martin Luther had it right. Martin Luther, who was a monk, who was being searched out by his own people in the Catholic Church. He was a Catholic monk, and they were trying to. Get, they were so mad at Martin Luther. They thought he was a heretic. That they were trying to get him to come to a meeting so they could capture him and kill him. He never left. He never left the Catholic Church. He did not start the Lutheran Church. His followers started the Lutheran Church. Martin Luther wanted to correct the doctrine of the Catholic Church. And he was saying to them, look, we've got all these external things about salvation that are nothing at all. And Paul and Martin Luther from the book of Romans says, you come to Christ by faith and faith alone and nothing else. It means nothing about circumcision or doing this. And by the time the Catholic Church got involved by the 1500s, at that point in time when Martin Luther is, is being a monk, uh, 1450 to 1525, somewhere along there, he's, he's saying, look, we don't, have to, we don't need to do all these things the church is making rules. In reality, the Catholic church at that point in time had started doing the exact same thing that the Jews were doing, making up all these rules and regulations that were not part of God's plan. So, all works. They're all works. That's right. It's, it's works. And so, the Catholic church, uh, they didn't get him. Uh, in fact, we, we don't really follow Martin Luther's teaching very much because of some of the other things he did. But John Calvin, who did break from the, from the Catholic Church, uh, was based on the same, same ideas, that there's problems, and he broke. 
Uh, we follow Zwingli. You don't even know that name, but most of our beliefs follow Zwingli. We think he was the closest to the scripture. He broke with the Catholic Church. All three of those guys were Catholic monks, Catholic priests and Catholic monks in monasteries who were studying the scriptures and saying, wait a minute, the church is not accurate. And so some of them tried to correct it, but did not have a, uh, a good uh, platform to do that from, and they were seen to be heretics. You don't think the Catholic Church and the church in those days, in fact, the church was the church, that was the church. The Catholic was, based, was worldwide at that point in time. It was the only church. It was the Catholic Church was the only one out there. Uh, they, uh, look, at, look at the Inquisition and see if it wasn't works-based. Just look at what they were doing. It was just absolutely needed to be reformed because they'd gotten off. In fact, what had happened was before, back in the 300s, they had brought up this idea and, and passed it in the Council of the Cardinals about uh, the Blessed Mother Mary. And the people in the pews were, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not, that's not what we should be doing. We shouldn't be worshiping Mother Mary. This was in the three, later, late 300s. And they began to revolt. And finally the Catholics decided, the leadership in the Catholic Church decided, we'll just fix that. So you see, all education was in the church. If you're not going to, we don't think you're going to be a priest or a nun or a royal, somebody of royal blood that might take royal leadership, you're not going to get an education. So we went into the dark ages. Finally, when the printing press came available in the... Uh, the Catholic Church realized that they were not going to win this battle any longer and we came out of the Dark Ages, finally. It all tied in with some other things going on. You've heard me talk about those things. But finally, the invention of the printing press put the, put the Word back into the people's hands and they were able to learn and go from there and read the Gospel again for their own selves. Well, Paul is saying in the book of Romans to the Gentiles and to the Jews alike, put away all those external things. Get to the point where you realize it's by faith and faith alone. That's all. That's the way it is. Faith and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ brings you into position with the Lord in salvation. Starting in chapter 12, he begins a list. Now, folks, we could go pretty fast on this, and then we're going to go as fast as we can. Uh, you're just going to have to grin and bear today and next week. We're going to finish next week, I think. We're not going to get through with this lesson. All your notes will be adjusted for next week. Wherever we end up is where we're going to cut off. The Word of God is just like a big old slab of baloney. You can cut it thick or you can cut it thin and it works every time. So wherever we end up today is where we'll pick up next week. <laughs> you didn't ever think about it that way, did you? <laughs> That's about that long, you know. Now, right, here we go. Chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I urge you, brethren, therefore... By the mercies of God. You see that stitch? Stitch of God. It's not by your mercies. It's by the mercies of God. God's doing. It was by God's doing that we even have the opportunity for salvation at all. By the mercies of God. God interjecting. Just like it's by the gospel of God. The son of God. The gospel of God. The grace of God. The power of God. The salvation of God. The righteousness of God. All the way through the book of Romans. We've seen where God is stitching into our lives. God is not just up there. He is actually looking out for you. And operating in your life every single day. And even when he, you think he's not answering your prayers. He is answering your prayers. It's just you're praying for the wrong thing. A no from God is silence. If God doesn't answer that prayer, you may be lusting and praying for the long, wrong thing, wanting something that's not going to happen in His will. I pray, therefore, by the mercies of God <laughs> to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. You're going to have to grin and bear this this week and next week. I don't normally do a lot of personal stories and personal things, but you're going to get stories through these so that you'll, you'll get these in your mind. This is the same list, by the way, in almost the same order that he, Paul gives in Ephesians and in Thessalonians. And he always starts off the list when he's talking about how you are to live your life. You are to live your life according to these things and... He always starts with something about the physical body. And here he says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. In Ephesians and Thessalonians, he says it like this. Do not be susceptible to sexual immorality. 
Same thing here. Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. That is your spiritual service of worship. The main worship you do is how you take care of your bodies and how you use your physical bodies. Last January, one of the young men that I am mentoring, in fact, I'm even mentoring some of his professors now. I send them my notes. They ask me questions and I email them because they've gotten this information from this kid as he's put it in news, into papers. And the, and the instructors are at, at the Baylor and some of the places are going, where are you getting this? And so they're getting it out of my notes. I'm sending it back to them. So now I'm sending these professors at Baylor notes. All right, you got that? just blows my mind. He emails me, and, and this is a kid that had gotten, had been in a, in a relationship with a girl. It's always, you know, that's, you know, broken hearted type thing. So he drops out of seminary, for, doesn't know what God's doing, doesn't know where he wants to go. So I, I don't even, I haven't even met this kid, but I'm emailing him. We've gotten together. We're, we're, I'm helping him in the study. He's found stuff on the, on the website. And so I'm mentoring him, and I do the right thing that a minister should do with a kid who's just broken hearted and has just stopped moving along in life. I basically, metaphorically, take my foot and, you know, kick him and get him on down the road and get him back in school and get him going. And he does. And finally, in January, he writes me. He says, Dr. Jim, I'm so happy that you helped me get to this school. I'm so happy that we've done this stuff. I have met the girl of my life and I'm going to get married in, Je in June. <laughs> So June 11th comes, and he got married in June. I've seen pictures of it. It was great. I didn't get to go because I was doing a wedding, and I'd already had it on the books, or I'd have been there. I don't even know him just by writing, okay? Pen pal type things. But when January, when he wrote to me, I want you to hear me. When he wrote to me and told me that he was getting married, I said, I said, Josh, I am thrilled. I am excited. I am, I am so old, just happy for the Lord and you and rejoicing. But I got some info, I've got some things I want to tell you about. Okay? And I go dot, dot, dot. Next paragraph. Don't open the package until after the wedding has happened. And I said, quotes, no wed, no bed. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Oops. That's the minister coming out in me. <laughs> to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. There are just some standards of God that we have to hold to. We just have to hold to them. Now, I say that to the young and to the old, to the one that's been married three times and looking at it again, and to the one that's looking at it for the first time. And I can go into many examples on this of what you do, what you put into your body, how you take your medicines the doctor is uh, telling you to take, how you look at what seven doctors are all giving you as medicines and want it, how you handle your body. Make it a living sacrifice. Make it a holy and living sacrifice. That's your acceptable service of worship is what you do with this flesh that you're living in now. Number two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, what is which is good and acceptable and perfect. Here we go. Don't fall into the crowd, but do what God's thing is. In the fifth grade, all the band kids in the fifth grade through the first year of high school were in the same grade, were all in the same class. Fifth grade, Miss Gardner was my English teacher. She taught English, she taught something else. And when she came into the class, we were the model class. There was no better class than this class. None. We were perfect for her. Then our math teacher would come in. She taught math and something else. And we were exceptional for her. Not model, but just exceptional. I don't know the name of the third teacher. I can see her. But all I know is the moment she came in, we turned into the devil class. She would get so mad at us, she'd take her textbook, she'd throw it on the ground, bam, and pick it up and throw it on the ground, bam, and that poor textbook had swollen, it had been thrown on the ground so many times. And she'd holler at us and tell us to shut up and to get, be good, and she was going to turn us in. And, and by the end of the semester, she didn't come back the next semester for some reason. <laughs> now, the word in the class was she went to Terrell, to a padded cell in Terrell, <laughs> because, we had, the, because according to the administration, our class had run her Looney Tunes. And every time she tried to take control of the class, we didn't care. 
The same class that was perfect for one teacher was a devil for another teacher. Well, actually, what it's the difference is, it's the world's way. Because we didn't know any different. We were following the world's way. And whenever she would try to correct us, it did not matter. We were, it was the mob effect. We just all joined in. Now, any one of us, even me, even me, right up there by her desk, right up there where everybody else is behind me, right up there, if it was one-on-one -on -one with me and her, I would have never acted that way. But when we get together in the world's way, everybody does it this way. Folks, when your kids, your grandkids, and you even say, well, everybody else is doing it, that is the world's way. You got it? We cannot do the world's way. We have to do God's way. We have to transform our minds as Christians to do whatever God wants it to be done, not what we want to be done. Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to, every, to each a measure of faith. Don't think of yourself better than someone else. Boy, I got an example for every one of these. It's going to take forever, but we're going to finish, I promise, next week. There's not a one of you who's not been here on Wednesday night. <clears throat> There's a young man who is a homeless guy. who he, only, he has shorts on, his shirt on. He never wears shoes whatsoever. He's got a bag with him. When he comes into our building, it's so cold in here, he puts on a pair of gray jumpers, jumper, overall jumpers, and he goes in and sits right behind Charles McKinley, poor man. Not Charles, the guy that comes in, because Charles is right in front of him. <laughs> Those of you who know Charles, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Because if he gets out of line, Charles is going to, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He's a great guy. But there's not a single person out here that when you see him come in barefoot into our service putting on his overalls as he comes through the door into the auditorium because it's so cold, you don't, want, you don't wonder, what's he doing here? I don't care. Even I do. I know him. But when he comes through the door, in my mind, back here in this part of it, saying, oh, there he is again. Okay? He's here to hear the word, he is here to hear the word of God. Now, here's the interesting thing. If the music goes more than 15 minutes, he's on his way out the door, and he's pulling off his overalls because he's going to the church next door to see if they've started preaching yet. Because he thinks if the music goes more than 15 minutes, he's ste the music guy is stealing from the preacher. Time. Maybe some of the rest of us should have an attitude like that. That we come for the Word of God rather than so much the music to entertain us. But the problem, the, the point of that illustration is we often think of ourselves too highly that we are better and we have a reason to be here and the guy coming through the door without shoes on. Every time he comes in, I get called and I go check him out to make sure he hasn't got a gun or something like that. But he's harmless up until this time. Every time he comes in, I'm going to go check him out. Even though I know he's harmless, I'm going to go trust but verify that everything is okay every single time. And I still have in my mind, oh my, he's here again. Okay, he has every right to be here. We should not think of ourselves more highly. For the measure of faith that he has and the intelligence that he has, we should respect him for that as we respect you. Verse 4, For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, if prophecy, the little phrase that's in italics is not in the oldest and most original text, so I skipped it because it actually confuses what he's saying here. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Well, when Paul is giving all this out here, each one of these things is important. And some of us, we have a hard time understanding the difference. But Paul is making some different points. The prophet is the one who's the preacher. Now, I am not a preacher in any way, form, or fashion. I fall in this category of teacher. Uh, I, in fact, I'm jealous of preachers. I really am. And you know why? Because it's through the foolishness of preaching that people come to the knowledge of salvation. When I pull off my belt, it has very few salvation notches on it. Because I'm a teacher, I'm not a, I'm not a preacher who preaches or prophesies. That's what this word means. A prophet is a person who excels in teaching the stories, the truths of God as led by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll explain that in a minute when I get down to teaching. When he talks about service here, service is the relief and attendance that we give to others. That we, how we help others. Teaching. 
Teaching is the instruction of the doctrines of God. This teaching is different from prophecy, or that's the same word as preaching, okay? The prophet or preacher tells the stories of God, persuading a person to come to the Savior. The teacher teaches a person how to live his new life with the Savior. Now, I, my belt, when I pull it off on teaching, I got bukus of notches. I'm going to have to get me some more belts because they're just got notches all over them. Of people that have come to the knowledge of the Lord, they've been saved through the person who has the gift of evangelism, through preaching, and then you get over into with me, be it here or on the internet or in the emails that go back and forth or the, or the eight or nine people who show up in my office every day because they come in with a prob problem, but everything in my office is a biblical problem. Every single thing is a biblical problem. And you don't come to my office for anything, financial counseling or anything, without Scripture being taught to you to get you mature or in the Lord. Is that correct? Mature or? Discipleship. discipleship, yes, but I want you to know what discipleship is. Maturing people in the Lord. That's where I get the notches on my belt because that's the gift that God gives to me. The exhorter is the one who brings solace and comfort to the lives of others. The giver is the one who provides resources to do the work of the Lord. The leader doesn't have to be a preacher, doesn't have to be a teacher, doesn't have to be an exhorter, but there are people who are leading, and what the purpose of leading is to keep people in the church on God's plan. On God's plan. Oh, I got a good story, but I'm not going to tell you on that one. The merciful, cheerful, cheerfully show all people compassion. Compassion. Compassion is not giving people what they want, but giving them what they need. Compassion is making sure that they know that you are there, whether they can help doing anything physically, but if they're just there. Folks, you don't understand, and most of you do in this class in reality, but the people who hear this may not understand how important it is just to be there. Even though you don't have any words to say, to bring comfort, you, you're just there. And sometimes the best thing you can do when you go be with somebody is just to go sit and keep your mouth shut. Because the person you're sitting with may want to be a chatty Kathy because they're so nervous they just want to talk. And you just sit there and listen and look at them and go, that's it. And it means so much to them. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Fake love is never acceptable to God. Love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Do not let evil come in, stay away from it, and when you see what is good, grab onto it and get close to it. Now, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Different love here, different love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Well, at first glance, that looks like that's some of the same stuff we've already covered on the previous couple of verses. But it's not. In Paul, they have different meanings for Paul. Here, look here. I've broken them down. Brotherly love. That can be summed up in kindness. Kindness. We are to be kind to all. Your next door neighbor, whoever, you've got to be kind to them. You've got to live outside the church like you live in the church. You've got to be kind. Giving preference to one another in honor means to esteem one another. Folks, everybody in here, every one of you has spe something special about you because you belong to God. And we esteem you and we, and, we, and we help build you up because you belong to God. Every one of you. Uh, not lagging behind in diligence. That's calling on the Christians. He's saying, look, don't be slow. If you've got the means to act and to help a Christian who is in need, do it and do it quickly. If you don't have the means, it's not that, that the person doesn't need to be helped, but God's not wanting to help through you. He's wanting to help through somebody else. But if you've got the means to help someone who is in true need, not want, but need, help them and do it quickly, not slow at all to help with what the Lord has provided. Being fervent, I love this, in spirit. Being fervent. The way, best way for you, we think of this today instead of the way we think of it when we read it, it's the glow that's about you because you're a Christian. When you walk into any place, 
the, the atmosphere changes because you were there, because you walk in and they know something is different about you and it's the Lord inside your life that is just glowing out. You're not going in there saying, praise Jesus, hallelujah, amen, I praise the Lord, you know Jesus and all that. No, you just walk into the room and the fervency, the glow that happens for you changes the way people react to you. It happens to me. Kay is just so ama amazed. We, you know, the, she'll be in a, in, a, in a store or something like that, and it's just, you know, kind of, bleh, and I'll walk in right behind her, and the whole atmosphere just changes. Just changes. I guess I look like a preacher. <laughs> You're a preacher, aren't you? That's right there, just tattooed, you know, something like that. You look like one of them evangelists. You know, I said, no, my hair's not slicked back quite enough. You remember we used to get that dippity do and put it in our hair? Y'all remember dippity do? <laughs> Comb that hair straight back and walk in. We'd smell like we'd got eight shades of some sort of toilet water on us. Isn't that what they call perfume? Toilet water? Toilet whatever? Okay. I'm sure I'm offending somebody right now. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. That means to show gladness in all the promises of the Lord. Rejoicing in all the promises. Rejoicing in the promises. You know, when we go to a funeral of a person who is older, we always say, oh, they're better off, you know, they were in such pain, and the Lord's just got, taking them on to be with them, and we just rejoice in that. And then a child who's five-year-old dies, and we don't rejoice. We don't, you know, we ought to rejoice, because the truth of this is the same promise for the older person is for the one who never accepted the Lord as a child, because they don't know the Lord, so the Lord's got them within their care. It's taking care of them. We don't understand it, so we have to have a sense of rejoicing that the Lord is caring for those and doing His business. Rejoice. The hope and the promises. It's the promise. The promise is that He's taking care of that child, just He's taking care of that older person. Persevering in tribulation means to be patient when trouble comes. Isn't that a novel idea? Be patient when trouble comes. To wait upon the Lord? Isn't that novel? You know, we don't do that, folks. We get in trouble. We start making our plans. We put it down on paper. We start going to see our banker, our, our, our broker, our whoever, because we think that we got to fix this problem. Wait on the Lord. Just wait. Just wait. Devoted to prayer. The word devoted here is different than the word devoted up in verse 10, down here, the one here. At the end of verse 12. This word devoted actually means instantly. Instantly going to prayer. Instantly. Devoted. Instantly. I mean, something good, instantly thank the Lord. When something bad happens, instantly say, hey God, what's going on? Instantly. Everything that happens. Right, you got it. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Now why? He's already told us we got to take care of the needs of the saints. No, he's put this in here for another reason. Because there are communities of saints elsewhere besides just in Rome, who are going to have some struggles. And what he's saying here is Christians should share with the other communities, the other churches who are struggling. So we need to help them and contribute to them. Practicing hospitality is, help, is, in his, is helping those we do not know when they are in need. Practicing hospitality. People we do not know. All right, get, on your, get, get your, get your um, Kleenexes out because this one's a, a good one. Two months ago, we had a gal show up in our office. She had gotten out of the military in January. She needed to go to the veterans hospital because she had a problem with her leg. Two months later, she shows up in her office. She is staying in a hotel in Pasadena. Let me back it up. There's a gal by the name of Stephanie Spears. Y'all know, remember Stephanie? Stephanie and David Spears. They moved off. Stephanie was supposed to have an appointment with me Stephanie's on crutches. It's time for Stephanie's appointment, and I hear the crutches coming in the door, and I said, through the door, around the corner, just come on in, I got your chair ready. The, the crutches come through, I turn around, and it's not Stephanie, it's this gal that was here two months ago. That all she needed was a ride to the VA, because they're going to have some tests, and, and, and some poor soul walked in my office, and I said, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm fixing to go down off of Alameda. You're going down off of Alameda? Good. You mean inside the loop? Yeah. I said, well, can you take her to the veterans? Because it's right there by Alameda. I said, Just a God thing. <laughs> Be careful if you walk in my office. <laughs> Took her down. Two months later, she shows up, walking through my door. Come on, sit down. She sits down. When I look at her, she's got a bandage here. 
they've taken off her leg from here down. She has, I see bulging out right here. I said, is that a port in your arm? She said, yeah, they're treating me for chemo, and they've sent me to Deke Slayton to do it. And I said, why have they sent you to Deke Slayton? She said, because they do something massive. I said, why are they doing that? She says, well, they found that I have stomach cancer, and it's gone to my pancreas. And I'm sitting here looking at her, and not a tear in her eye. And I said to her, girl, do you know what all that means? She says, no. She says, I'm just trying. I said, Where, where's your family? She said, well, my mom died of cancer five years ago, and my dad just died of old age two years ago. I said, do you have any brothers and sisters? No, I don't have any. Do you have any relatives? No, my dad was the only child. My mom was the only child. Where'd you grow up? Here in Pasadena. Do you not have anybody? Nobody. And finally, I get around to, get around to okay, now that we found that, that out, what do you need? And she says, well, I'm in a hotel because they let me out. I've got my car, <clears throat> but I need three more nights worth of rent at the hotel, and I'll get my money from, from the state once she gets it one time a month, and I'm going to go get an apartment in Paraland. I've already got it picked out, and then I'm going to get some furniture. And I said, well, don't get any furniture. I'll get the furniture for you. And she, she, I said, how much do you need? She needed $80 or $100 or what it was. So we ended up giving her $250. And I said, look, pay for this, and here's money for food. And then get your money, and I want to hear back from you. And we did some more. I introduced her to Emory. And my heart is broken for this gal. Well, she shows back up on Wednesday. She shows back up on Wednesday. Now, we, we don't really know. I mean, she's got the port. She's, the leg is off. It's tied up. Uh, we know that two months ago she had a leg because she was in our office. You understand? We're following this truthfulness thing going on here. <clears throat> Wednesday she shows up and she has a, band, a, 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 a hospital identification on and she's got the needle thing in her arm and I'm going, I don't think they let people out of the hospital with that thing in their arm, you know? And so I said to her, I said, I walked out, I said, hey girl, how can we help? What's going on? And she said, well... They call me back, and I have to go back. They're, they have found that the sarcoma, or whatever it is, is actually further up my leg, and they're going to have to take more of my leg off, and they're going to do that tomorrow. And I said, I said, are you supposed to be in the hospital? She said, yeah, but I had some business I had to take care of, and so I left. I said, so you left without the doctor's permission? And she said, yes. And so I said, well, what do you need? She said, well, right now my problem is, is I'm just out of gas. She said, I thought I had enough gas to get home and get this business taken care of. And, and she said, but I'm out of money. I bought my furniture. I said, oh, I told you I'd get you the furniture. And so she gave us permission to talk to her manager. We called and talked to the manager. She, everything just panned out, everything she said. Called the hospital. Sure, she had left without doctor's permission. Went back, introduced her to Rex. Went, Rex went to see her the next morning. Sure enough, she had been there overnight. She was supposed to have the surgery. They postponed the surgery till the afternoon. So if she thought about something else she had to do in the morning. <laughs> so she unhooks herself from the IV bag and all that type of stuff and just takes off and shows back up and has the surgery, okay? She's just 26, 27 years old, just a gal out there. I've asked her, do you know the Lord? She said, I'm not ready for that. I'm going, oh, you know, I'm not ready for that. So to me, that's sick them, you know. That's, that's the way my heart is. And so I got Rex, I've got Emory, I've got other people. And I looked at her and I said, girl, I said, you know, this is not going to end up good. This is not going to end up good. And she says, I know it's not going to end up good. I said, I want you to live by yourself as long as possible, but we may have to get involved. Someone may have to either come live with you or you may have to go live with somebody else until your final day. And she said, well, if you can help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. Folks, that is an example of the church being the church and practicing hospitality to those who we do not know who are in need. We don't know her. Everything that's happened with her has panned out. Everything we found to be the truth, she's just out there, just a wandering soul who's just trying her best to take care of business. And she's going to need help. That's hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Look on. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I can tell you stories here. 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, treat every single person with the same respect and all that we are all equal with the Lord, that it's level ground at Calvary for everybody. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of men. Why? 
In other words, that would be better translated like this. And when I find a phrase that really we need to translate for today, that would say, never injure someone who has injured you. Provide and do what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, get this, if possible, as so far as it depends on you, if possible, it's not always possible in other words, as it depends on you, may depend on somebody else different, but as it depends on you, look at this, be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. We had this beautiful cockatoo, stood about that tall, umbrella cockatoo, had had it 14 years. Those things live to be 90 years old. So when you get them when you're 40, you're going to have to will that bird to somebody. You got that? <laughs> had it at our house. It was happy as a lark. Well, it wasn't a lark. It was a cockatoo. Out in this cage, huge cage in our backyard. But those birds get to be human birds because we raised it. It didn't know any different. I mean, it, it came out of the egg and we got it. And we raised it up, hand fed it and everything. So it thought K was its mama. <laughs> didn't look the same, but thought it was its mama. <laughs> That bird was out there, rah, 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 rah. We started getting notes from this house behind us <laughs> that we were going to have to do something because you could hear that bird screaming from Bay Oaks to I-45. <laughs> I mean, I could turn on the Clear Oak City Boulevard at that Exxon station there, I-45. I could hear the bird, rah, rah. Not really, but it was almost that loud. Just echoing through the canyons of those big old houses over there. So finally we made a decision. We had to do something with the bird. We found a person who lived out, out in the country, had birds, loved birds, had two cockatoos. This bird is in, the, in a room that's about 20 by 20 outside. Cave. It is happy bird. It's doing great. They squawk all they want. Nobody hears them. It's great. But we got all these notes from this person behind us that caused us to get rid of that bird. That family has now got a macaw. And that macaw, you can hear from Bay Oaks to Friendswood. Wood. Get on past 45, all right? And it is so tempting to take those notes that they wrote to us and just take in their handwriting, put it back on their door, one at a time, just like they did us. But we're not going to do that, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own re revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He's taking that from Deuteronomy. God promises that he'll take care of these things. 20, but if, you're, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heat burning coals on your head. I can tell you this story because, on his head, uh, that's, just, that's just what's called agreement in, in English, okay? Making sure it's right. They would be plural. He is, is singular. I'm learning, I'm learning English now for the first time in all these years. Finally learning to write. Rosemary Rayburn is in my office every week helping me learn to write, finally. I only took freshman English in college four times. And <laughs> finally getting it, I think, after all the writing I do. So some of it I look back and I'm appalled. But anyway, I give you this example because um, none of the families are here. They are all gone to be with the Lord. Years ago, 15 years ago now, we had two couples in our, in our church. Didn't know it was two couples. One of the families showed up, and they had, tr they had gone to one of these courses where they try you, you buy a house, but you buy it and sell it before you have to pay for it. You've heard of that? So she had put $10,000 down on a contract with a family to buy this house, but she was trying to sell it, but she couldn't get it sold. And the next day it was up, she was going to lose her $10,000. I found out who the, um, the uh, other person was, and it was a member of our church. Now, if you lawyers in this, in this room, um, don't, don't, um, that was a long time ago. I don't do things the same way anymore, but I'm going to tell you how it happened. Because I did probably open up liability issues. Uh, so I pick up the phone and I called the, the church member and I said, look, you know, we're in the church and instead of handling this in court, um, can we handle this out of court? I said, look, this is what they did. They went to this silly course and they thought they could do this and it's just not going to work out. The market's just not there. And it just can't work out. And I said, um, that she, she said, well, I'll just give her her money back. Well, that was of her own volition. She'll just give her money back. So she gives her $10,000 back. And the family that came to see me is very happy. And next thing I know, my name is Mud to the other family. In fact, it is just Mud. Everybody's here. And I mean, my name is Mud, 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 Mud. I mean, it's not just dark Mud. It's black Mud. I mean, it's just mm, Mud, okay? Any kind of Mud you want to talk It's all over me. It's just Mud. Uh, you, you go to the grocery store and you run into her, it, it doesn't matter what the subject is, she's going to tell you about me down there at the grocery store. 
Chuck Snyder calls me and says, hey, this person's got odd against you. Why don't you call him and talk to him? I said, I did. About three months later, Chuck Snyder calls me and says, hey, this person still got odd against you. I did, so I talked to him. About two months later, Chuck Snyder calls me and says, Jim, we still got a problem with this person. I said, Chuck, I've been twice. I'll go again. This is going to be the last time. Went and tried to make it. Didn't work. For the next two and a half years, didn't work. Chuck would call me and say, oh, I've just heard another thing. I said, Chuck, we've already been three times. This is, we just got to chalk it up. This is the cost of doing business. I have done everything. I've apologized and everything. Over and over and over again. I have graveled. I've got on my feet. I've washed their feet. I've done everything I can do. Washed their feet in my tears in some ways. Actually not done washed their feet, but I've been to them. I mean, looked at them face to face, eyeball to eyeball, to say, look, you know, you, I'm sorry the way it happened. Didn't change anything. As soon as I left, she was just on the phone telling somebody I had the gall to be there and talk to her. By the way, when somebody's offended by you, I know people like to read that Matthew 18 scripture that says, go to them and tell them, you and you alone. Read the NIV. The correct is, if you see somebody sinning against somebody else, you go and talk to them. But in Matthew 18 verse 21, Peter says to the Lord, Lord, but what if they offend me? And he says, you just forgive them. I should have never gone to her because I just kept making it worse. I should have just forgiven her. Just forgiven her. But because Chuck asked me to, three times I went. Just made it worse. It always makes it worse. I've never seen it work. I've always seen it when you go back, it just makes things worse. Well, the rest of the story. Two years later, I hear that she needs a procedure and they don't have the money. I pick up the phone and I call her and I say, I've heard that you need a procedure and you don't have the money. She says, no. She says, we'll just... Wait on the Lord. I said, well, the Lord has just called. We're going to pay for that procedure. I pay for that procedure. That gets her past all their personal expenses. And within 18 months, we have to also pay for the funeral. But in that 18 months, there wasn't a person that she talked to that she didn't sing my praises. Because I did not judge her based on what she had done before. I only did good to her. Be at peace with her. And never take revenge for anything. And in my goodness giving to her when she had a need, and it was a need, it really was a need, that was like heaping burning coals on her head. You see it? That's what we have to do. As Christians, when people do not do things to us correctly, we need to just take it, grin it, bear it, and wait for the opportunity to do good for them. Verse 20, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I like that word overcome. It's not what you think. The word overcome is better translated drowned. Do not be drowned by evil, but drowned evil with good. When you see struggles come your way, don't let them drown you, but you drown them. Well, you got a lot of pages left, don't you, in your notes? It's all right. This is just like baloney. Cut it off any place it works. We're going to cut off right now. We'll start next week with chapter 13. And pick there up because I want you to understand, I want to change your heart and how you deal with some things. We could run through this, but I don't want to run through it. I want you to catch how you should live. And you're never too old to learn, folks. By the way, I want to learn how to make one of those monkey knot things, that thing. So that's <laughs> my deal with you. I'm never too old to learn something new, and I don't know how to do that. And I bet you I'm fixed to learn how to do that, John. You still know how to make that monkey foot thing? Oh. <laughs> Folks, I have a need. Will somebody show compassion and come teach me how to make one of them? Oh, I love that. I've got to learn how to do that. i also got to learn how to, how to, pot, to bevel glass before I die. I want to learn how to do that. Just one of, That doesn't mean anything, does it? Let's pray and get out of here. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. As we look at the instructions that you have given to us through Paul, every one of us in here has probably failed to do one of these things this week. And we're not even through with the list, Lord. But teach us, but train us, and we thank you that you are patient with us as we live our lives, always willing to help us get closer to you one day at a time as we study your word. Lord, it's been a great Bible study. We love you, care for you, think about you every moment, and we want to instantly pray as everything comes our way. Thank you for being there for us, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. All right, if I don't see y'all here, I'll see y'all there. <laughs>